Well, everybody, welcome to our webinar today. We are pleased to have Jonathan Neville with us again. This is part three of an ongoing series. Might be the last one for a while anyway, but uh, Jonathan is just a wealth of knowledge. Um, he's he's written a lot of books. He's made numerous presentations. He teaches online institute. He's uh, an artist, as you can see in the background here. And so uh, we're just really grateful to have him today. And his topic today is going to be about what happened to the gold plates and how many plates did Joseph Smith actually translate from. And so he's going to He's going to walk us through some of the things that I guess have been right in front of our faces for a long time and haven't necessarily popped out at us. And so, uh, Jonathan, with that, we'll let you get started. And if anybody has a question as we're going along, I will monitor the Q&A. So if at the bottom of your screen, if you have a question, click Q&A and just type a question in there. If it's super relevant to what Jonathan's talking about, I'll just interrupt him and at some point and ask him the question right then. If it's more general, we'll wait till the end of his uh, presenting phase. And uh, with that, Jonathan, we're, we're okay. all here. Okay, well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation, Oak. And I hope everybody uh, gets something out of this today. I think you will, but please feel free to ask questions because I don't know what questions you have unless you ask them. And, you know, I've, I've tried to answer or anticipate questions and answer them in advance, but there's always someone that has a question I haven't thought of before, and I love those. So the other thing is I, I do have a PowerPoint here. I don't want the whole thing to be just, you know, a narrated PowerPoint. But on the other hand, when I don't put the pictures up, it's harder to describe them. So I'm just going to start it. I'll, I'll try to stop every so often for a discussion, but I'll still... Um, rely on some of these pictures to help this all make sense. So let me get the right slide here. Okay. So the first one here, um, it's still loading, it says. Okay, you should see it now. So this is, um, well, the time happened to the goal. It's a book that I wrote, uh, actually is about six years ago. It's gone through several, a few revisions anyway. But I, I the subtitle is Insights from the Joseph Smith Papers, and that's because I try to always rely on uh, original sources. And the Joseph Smith Papers, of course, is full of wonderful resources for us. There's some resources that are not in the Joseph Smith Papers that we'll use also. I just encourage everybody to uh, refer to the Joseph Smith Papers. And then I, I like to have this graphic, too, about the Hill Cumorah in New York, how this is the place of the final battles just to start off with. But today is particularly interesting because it's um, the, it's close to the 200th anniversary of the first time Joseph Smith got the plates, or at least saw the plates. And that's a significant milestone. I mean, obviously 200 is just an arbitrary number, but we like even numbers. So it's a, an important time to review this history. And of course, the Book of Mormon is the, the New World Testament of Christ that goes along with the Bible. And I like to always say that it's an authentic history of real people. It's not uh, a myth. It's not a parable. It's an authentic history of real people. And one cartoon I like to illustrate this is this one. In, in case you can't read that, I'll, I'll read it out loud. So this is um, the Lehi and his wife and the boys going back to Jerusalem. And she says, while you're picking up the brass plates, would you also grab my good dinner plates? In the rush to flee Jerusalem, I left them behind. And I like that because it shows that the these were real people that had real concerns. And, and I could just see her really wishing she had brought more things with her from Jerusalem. Okay, then we also have the mission to the Lamanites that uh, Oliver Cowdery and Parley Pratt and the others went on. And I bring this up just because during this mission, um, Parley Pratt brought up a, a, a made a really interesting comment. He he talked about the he, he was relating how they described the Book of Mormon to the Indians, and he said this book, which contained these things, was hid in the earth by Moroni in a hill called by him Camora, which is which hill is now in the state of New York near the village of Palmyra in Ontario County. 
He says, in that neighborhood, there lived a young man named Joseph Smith, who prayed to the Great Spirit much in order that he might know the truth. And the Great Spirit sent an angel to him and told him where this book was hid by Moroni and commanded him to go get it. He accordingly went to the place, dug in the earth, and found the book written on golden plates. But it was in the language of the forefathers of the red man. Therefore, this young man, being a pale face, could not understand it. But the angel told him and showed him and gave him knowledge of the language and how to interpret the book. So he interpreted it into the language of the pale faces and wrote it on paper and caused it to be printed and published thousands of copies among them and then sent us to the red men to bring some copies of it to them and to tell them this news. So I, I like to, I don't know how many of you have read Parley Pratt's autobiography. It's a fantastic book for many reasons, but I like this this um, explanation of it to the Native Americans in, in this area of New York and Ohio and Missouri, because Parley told them it was written in the language of their forefathers. And that's important to keep in mind. This is just to get us in the flavor of the, the early days. This is Joseph Smith's family, his father, Joseph Smith Sr., and all of his siblings are in this uh, picture. Uh, Joseph Smith is on the far right in that kind of um, beige shirt, I guess, next to his sister who's wearing a white uh, dress. And just to orient us all so we know what areas we're talking about, this is a graphic of the Palmyra area. And here you see the Smith farmhouse in the circle on the upper left and the Hill Camorra on the lower right. So it's, it's a distance of about three miles. This is the recreation of the log cabin that they lived in. That if you visit Palmyra today, you can go see it. And this is uh, to show you where the cabin is, where the sacred grove, well, sacred grove is the forest behind it there. And then again, this is to just give, you, give us some orientation, the log cabin and then the farmhouse is where they moved after 1825. The temple today sits there and then there's a chapel uh, just north of the temple. So that, this is where some of these events took place. Again, here's the house. This is the upstairs of the cabin as it looks today. But we think it was, it could have been here or in the other house. We don't know for sure, but it was one of these houses where Moroni visited Joseph Smith. And when he visited him, one of the things he said was, and, and a lot of people don't know this history. You can read it in the Joseph Smith papers, but people don't know it's there because it hasn't been uh, publicized a lot. But he said this history was written and deposited not far from that place, meaning Joseph's house. So if it was written and deposited not far from there, that means Mormon and Moroni lived in that same area around Palmyra. And then Moroni said, and it was our brother's privilege, if obedient to the commandments of the Lord, to obtain and translate the same by the means of the Urim and Thummim, which were deposited for that purpose in the record. And we've talked in the previous webinars about the translation with the Urim and Thummim and why that was so important. But this is what Moroni told him that very first night. Um, and so, of course, Moroni, when he was uh, had finished his addition to the plates his father had given him, buried him in this stone box on the hill Camorra. Here's another account of Moroni's first visit. And this is from Lucy Mack Smith, Joseph's mother. She quoted Moroni uh, to say, the record is on a side hill on the hill of Camorra, three miles from this place. Remove the grass and moss and you will find a large flat stone. Pry that up and you will find the record under it lying on four pillars of cement. And then the angel left him. Now, if you remember what I just read about Parley Pratt, he said the same thing, that Moroni was the one who called this hill Camorra in the, at the very beginning. And so that's how we know this is the hill Camorra. Okay, here's another map to show that Joseph Smith log home. And then the walk to Camorra is about three miles, a little less than three miles. And then from a drone, I took this drone shot to show the farmhouse. And then in the distance back there is the Hill Camorra. So that's a, a, probably enough orientation. This is what the Hill Camorra looked like until about a year ago when they've torn out these walkways and they planted trees to fill in that open gap when they discontinued the pageant there. So um, skipping forward now to 1827, Joseph Smith and Emma, Smith, uh, Emma got married in South Bainbridge, which is in um, 
southern New York, just north of Pennsylvania. And I just want to show this because they go back and forth here. And it's interesting for people to see where they got married. This is early 1827. This is the mantle where it's taken from the minister's house where they got married. They moved it to this house to show where they were married. But then they moved back to Palmyra. And this is kind of the route back to Palmyra from um, uh, Pennsylvania, Harmony and uh, Bainbridge. And this was significant because while they went back to Palmyra, on one occasion, Joseph Smith did an errand for his father. And when he came back, he was late at night and his father wanted to know what had happened. And you can read about this. But he said, he told his father, stop, father. It was the angel of the Lord as I passed by the hill of Cumorah where the plates are. The angel met me said I had not been engaged in that. This is a late 1800s uh, picture of the Hill Cumorah. And it was his mother said this is made known to him that it was at this interview that he should make one more effort to obtain the plates on September 22nd. And that was September 22nd of 1827. Jonathan? Here's, yeah. You're saying that, th go back one slide, that right there is the Hill Cumorah in the late 1800s? Yes. Uh huh. So there's like no trees. There's no trees. So and would, now, go ahead. It would have been obvious. I always pictured it as the forest like it is today, yeah. but it would have been <laughs> obvious to Joseph where the stone box was. Well, that's why this is really an interesting point. Oak. First off, we don't, it's not sure how wooded it was, mm -hmm. the hill at the time, because no one really had a record of it. The southern part of the hill was, was, um, cleared for sure because they were farming it because it was kind of flatter. The Native Americans, because this is the highest hill in the area, the Native Americans usually kept the highest hills clear of trees so they could send signals, you know, smoke signals from one hill to the next, and they could uh -huh. communicate over long distances. And so the Hill Camorra would have been kept barren by the Native Americans. But then by Joseph Smith's time, some of it had been wooded. You could see there's a couple of trees on there. Yeah, now, this is the late 1800s, so this is 50 years or so after uh, Joseph Smith got the plates. And so we, we don't know, we don't have a photograph from the 1830s. Right. So we don't know for sure what it looked like, but this is what it looked like in the late 1800s when people went to visit. Hmm. In fact, this next picture shows the the same hill with a, a wagon and a buggy there, but it's the same, same th idea. It was clear. Now, this is what I was going to get at is, if you remember what Lucy said, that Moroni told him, there is a flat stone covered with moss. A lot of times artists have depicted the stone over the Hill Camorra as kind of a big boulder. But if it was a big boulder, it would be obvious, right? Yeah. And so if it was a flat stone covered with moss, he, he told him he had to remove the moss and the grass. So it was pretty well covered. It would not have been obvious if he hadn't been directed to it. So, in other words, the stone had been covered with dirt and grass and, and moss. So that's that's one reason why her account is so important, and you don't read about it very often. And apparently the artists who have depicted this scene hadn't read her account because I've seen pictures of it like this big rock that he's prying open with a lever and all that. Mm -hmm. But it was just a flat stone. So this, this picture here is looking north towards um, Palmyra from the Hill Camorra. This guy is sitting on top of the Hill Camorra. So you could see even when they took this picture, it was barren, just covered with grass. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's an interesting point. So um, anyway, September of 1827, like I mentioned, they go to the hill. Joseph and Emma borrowed a wagon and they went to the hill. And then, of course, and this picture shows him bringing the plates back that night, which he didn't do. He he brought those, he, he buried them in a log and brought them back a while later. But he did bring back the Urim and Thummim that night. And so here are the, here's another famous picture of Moroni um, showing him the plates and, and how when he retrieved the, the plates, he was attacked on the way home, which was a couple of days later. But anyway. Okay, now an interesting thing about the plates is there's different descriptions of them, right? Joseph Smith and the eight witnesses and Orson Pratt said they had the appearance of gold. And then David Whitmer called them golden plates. William Smith said it was a mixture of gold and copper. 
So there's some some discrepancy in these. We know for sure it had the appearance of gold. The only place that we know were solid gold were the plates of, that ether had, because it talks about them in the text. But those aren't the ones that were here on the hill. Uh, William Smith said they weighed about 60 pounds, and his father said they weighed about 30 pounds. And his father actually said he weighed them on a scale. But even a 60-pound estimate, William Smith and other farmers know how much things weigh because they handled grain and, and crops by weight. So they knew what 60 pounds would weigh. So there's that's a major discrepancy. It seems like Joseph, William, go ahead. William would have been younger than Joseph. Yeah. And so about, I mean, like when Joseph got the plates, I can totally see, like you said, his father would be a lot more uh, experienced at, you know, mm -hmm. hefting a certain weight and knowing what it was. So William may have been, I, I don't know, how, how much younger is he than Joseph? Well, he was, I don't remember exactly how much younger. He was a teenager, but still, or young, maybe he was only 10 or 11. I'd have to re refresh my recollection on that. But other people said it was 60 pounds also. It wasn't just William. Okay. I, I just put him in here. And whether he weighed him, he never said he weighed him. But that's what people said. So that's why he said that. Okay. Joseph Smith Sr.'s, it was an interview he did with Tiffany Monthly that was published later. But in there, he did say that he weighed him. So, hmm. but that's that discrepancy is going to come up in a minute. And I'll, I'll explain okay. why we have that. And then just to give you an idea, 60 pounds of, uh, Gold, depending on the, when I did this, the spot price was 1200 It's more than that now, but it would be worth over a million dollars. So you can see why a lot of people were trying to get the plates, right? Sure. When they heard about them. Okay, so the question is, what was in the stone box? And that's a key point to what we're going to talk about today. But before, people always ask me, where was the stone and cement box? Now, this is the setup for the pageant that they used to have at the Hill Cumora. And they discontinued that. But in the pageant, where this red circle is, is where they have the the hole in the ground where the actor portraying Joseph Smith gets the gold plates. But people who have been there for a long time say that the second red circle, a little bit to the right here, further south on the hill, there used to be a marker saying that this is where the box was, the stone box was. And I think the, one of the reasons they do that is people from Utah went out to Palmyra in the late 1800s to inquire about church history. The people who lived in them a stone box that had slid down the hill, and they all said, well, it was right about here, because they all knew where this stone box was. Of course, it was empty, but they that's where, I guess you could say legend, people who lived there at the time said that's where it was. So not far from where it was in the pageant. Okay, so now back to the question of what was in the stone box. And we can ask, what does the title page say? Now, why would I ask about why the title page? It's The title page tells us what's in the book, right? It was the last leaf of the place, Joseph Smith said. And it tells us, just like if you have a table of contents today, we put it at the front of the book. Anciently, they put it at the end of the book. But it tells us what was in there. So the title page says this, and we won't read the whole thing, just a few highlights here. There's a count written by the hand of Mormon upon plates taken from the plates of Nephi. In other words, he took them from, he, he abridged them. So it was an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi, sealed by the hand of Moroni. Now that's significant because Moroni had his own little book called the Book of Moroni, as well as the last couple chapters of his father's Book of Mormon. So that's what he did when he sealed it. He wasn't abridging anything. He was sealing it. But then also there is a, an abridgment in the green here, taken from the Book of Ether, which is a record of the people of Jared. So we have an abridgment of the people of Nephi, abridgment of the people of Jared, and Moroni's sealing or Moroni's original works. That's what was in the plates. So I summarize that here. An abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi, abridgment of the record of the people of Jared, sealed by Moroni. And then I have this little graphic to show what was in Moroni's box. The abridged record of the people of Nephi, and we know the books that were in there because the first one, Joseph Smith said that he translated with Martin Harris, was the book of Lehi. And then we have Mosiah, Alma, Helaman, 35, 4th Nephi, Mormon. Then the abridged record of the Jaredites, which is the book of Ether. And then Moroni's original uh, record. 
And Moroni, even in that original, if you if you when we read Ether, he says, now there's plates in here that are sealed that you, you're not allowed to touch, he told Joseph Smith, because it wasn't he wasn't authorized to do it, but they were in there. So the sealed records were in the same um, collection of plates that was in Moroni's stone box. So that's everything that we know from the title page was in the stone box. Now you may think there's parts of the Book of Mormon missing, and we're going to come to that why in a minute. Okay, Mormon 6.6, 6, he explained that um, this is Mormon, said he made the record out of the place of Nephi, hid up in the hill Cumorah all the records which have been entrusted to me by the hand of the Lord, save it were these few plates which I gave to my son Moroni, which were the uh, abridged plates. So what was in the Cumorah repository? That's the next question. We saw what was in the stone box, what was in the Cumorah repository. Here's a, an artist's depiction of Mormon abridging the Nephite records. He had all these records that he had. If you remember early in his life, he was asked to um, go to the Hill Shim and add to the records that were there. That's where all the Nephite records were. And so here's him abridging those records. Jonathan? Yeah. Since you brought up the Hill Shim, let me ask this question. Uh, somebody posted in the Q&A, how far... From is it from the Hill Shim to Hill Cumorah? About 345 AD, Mormon moves records from Shim to Cumorah. Right. We don't we don't know how far it is. All we know is David Whitmer, when he was asked if the where the plates were today in his time, let's say 18, 1880s, he said they're in New York. And they said, Are they in the Hill Cumorah? And he said, No, but they're not far from there. And we know that from the in Mormon's account, he said he took all the records from the Hill Shim because the, the Lamanites were overrunning the land and moved them to the Hill Cumorah. So it couldn't have been that far. We we don't know how far, but he was, you know, his whole army was in retreat from the Lamanites. They had to gather up all the records and move them as fast as they could. So presumably, I wouldn't think it was more than a couple days trip at the most. So and. and and we know from the direction they were going that it had Hilshim had to be west of Hill Cumorah. So most of us who've looked at this think that Hilshim is somewhere in western New York. How far we don't know. I mean, there's there's been lots of speculation about that, but so far well, we don't well, know. One more question, Jonathan, while yeah. we're on this. Um sure. Bruce asks, why do you keep calling it the stone box? Because Joseph called it the cement and stone box. And he said, Kathy Burris's father located the stone covering the cement and stone box, and it was used in the movie How Rare a Possession. I'm not aware of that, but that that's yeah. what, well, what that's happened. that's the one I alluded to when I said they when people went out there, they found this the uh the lid of the stone box. There was a corner of it chipped off. I call it the stone box because saying stone and cement is just too long. <laughs> but you're right. I mean it is. It, it was cemented up. If, if you remember what Lucy said, she said there are four pillars of cement that we just read. And it, whether it was this, the pillars of cement or it was the cement holding the stones up, she wasn't that clear about it. Oliver Cowdery described it in more detail. I, I didn't really want to take the time to go in through the whole description of the box. But it was, it, it was it's a good comment because it was not only stone, it was also stone and cement. It's the only known Nephite cement that we have, actually, mm -hmm. historically. You know, people talk about, well, where's the Nephites had cement? And we say, yeah, Mor <laughs> Moroni used it to build a stone box right on the Hillcomore in New York. The only Nephite cement we have in, the, in existence that we know for sure was in New York. So, Okay, so getting back to this, in the repository of all the Nephi records, there were the brass plates, we know, the original plates of Lehi that Nephi referred to, the Mormon abridged, the large plates of Nephi, which were their records that the Nephites kept, the plates of Ether, the 24 gold plates, and then the small plates of Nephi were also in the repository. And so from there, we get this diagram. How we got the abridged plates. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, one more. So the abridged plates that Mormon did are in red. He abridged the book of Lehi and the large plates of Nephi. The abridged plates that Moroni did were of Ether as well as the sealed portion of Ether's plates. 
So that's how we got those. And then, of course, Moroni did his own um, his own writings. So that's that's a diagram just to explain the who did which set of abridged plates and how they ended up in the stone box. Jonathan. Yeah. On that last slide, do you like on the right there where you've got the abridged record going from Lehi to Mosiah? Do you believe that if Mormons abridging this, I mean, because Lehi dies in Second Nephi three, uh, right. and, and so if he passed away at that point and Nephi becomes king, wouldn't there have been more abridging of? Nephi's actual writings on those plates that would have been sandwiched between Lehi and Mosiah? Well, we it's hard to say, but in the um where's my this is the 1830 Book of Mormon. Yeah. And he says uh, Joseph Smith in in the preface in here said that he took the 116 pa pages of Martin Harris Loss. He took those 116 pages from the Book of Lehi. So that, that whole first session, he said, was from the Book of Lehi. Right. It just seems like if Mormons are bridging it and Nephi had a significant piece of uh, time as the leader keeping that record, that there would be more from him. So so essentially, well, Lehi was the first one that started writing when Nephi made the plates. Right. Well... See, what, what it says here, he says, the which I took from the book of Lehi, which was an account abridged from the plates of Lehi. And so one way to interpret it is Nephi continued his record, but on the plates of Nephi. So it would have been or, or the plates of Lehi. So it would have continued to be the book of Lehi. And then it was, remember, he said, well, I'm going to make my own account also. Mm -hmm. And that's what was the small plates. So the books in the Book of Mormon are named after the original author, right? And yep. so yep. we have the Book of Nephi now, but it, originally it would have been the Book of Lehi, presumably all the way to the Book of Mosiah. And that's, that brings up the other issue of why is it called the Book of Mosiah when it starts with King Benjamin? And that's because of the, the first two chapters were, we think were lost with the 116 pages. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to get into that kind of detail, <laughs> but normally a book in the Book of Mormon starts with the first writer mm -hmm. and it just continues on. You know, the Book of Alma goes over a long period of time, right? But it was it was started by Alma. The Book of Mosiah was started by um, the original King Mosiah, but it went through King Benjamin and then King Mosiah. So there are additional authors after that, but the book was named after the one who started it. So you would have the, the book of Lehi that Nephi could have continued, but it still would have been called the book of Lehi. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. It, it's confusing because there, we, we talk about large place, small place, large place of Nephi, small place of Nephi, book of Lehi. <laughs> it's it's hard to, to itemize it exactly, and people have different interpretations of it. But I think when we consider how Joseph Smith described it, that he doesn't say anything about another book other than the book of Lehi that was in 116 pages. Hmm. But then if you remember also when, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. okay. When we, we'll get to section 10 and talk about that a little bit too. Okay. So here, this is the diagram and there was a repository with all the original records. And then the, the plates that Mormon gave to Moroni were the abridged plates. These few plates, he called it. And those Moran and I put in the stone box. So then when um, the, the repository was in the Hill Cumorah, Joseph Smith took the abridged plates down to Harmony, Pennsylvania, after he got them in uh, 1827. Okay, then, of course, Martin Harris gave him the $50 so he could go down there. I'm going to skip through some of this history because I think we know it. Joseph and Emma moved to Harmony in December. This is the route, roughly, that they took. Uh, if you've ever been to the Priesthood Restoration site, here's where the Isaac Hale home is, this small cabin that Joseph and Emma had here down the road from their parents' house. This is the baptismal area. I'll just give you this for some of the flavor. This is the Isaac Hale home, Emma's parents. 
that's looking down the road to the cabin where uh, Joseph and Oliver, or Joseph and Emma lived. This is, um, after they moved out, this two-story addition was added to it on the right. But this is a picture as, as their cabin looked in 1880. And the church has since restored it. This is what it looks like today if you go visit. And inside they have a table set up with the... Uh, stand there some of the period furnishings just to give you a flavor of what it was like in joseph smith's day this is a red box that he used to keep the plates in that's not that's a replica of it and then some of the bedrooms so anyway so martin harris walked all the way from palmyra to harmony over 100 miles and he got the characters now most likely at this point we think these characters are from the small plates of nephi not the ones that Joseph took to New York. And there's a, that's another topic. I put them in here anyway to represent the kind of characters that uh, Martin Harris took to New York. He went to, um, left first he went up to Albany, and then he went down to New York City to show them to the professors, and then he came back to uh, uh, Harmony. So they started working as a scribe. Here's an artist's uh, depiction of the plates, the breastplate and the interpreters the Urim and Thummim. Here's another artist depiction uh, how those might have worked. Here's how they might have uh, been carried around and so on. Okay, so here's here's the table similar to the one that they would have worked on. And here they show the place covered. When I was there, I pulled back the cover so I could see the place, and that's what they looked like. All right, so with all that in mind, now we're getting back to this. The first 116 pages Joseph translated, uh, it was written mostly by Martin Harris. Not all, but some, or most of it. Martin Harris took the 116 pages back to Palmyra to show his wife. That's where they got lost. Uh, one question that often comes up is why 116 pages? And, and this is kind of, I think it was Royal Skousen who developed this theory that they would have uh, six sheets of paper, this fool's cap papers, oversized paper to what we use today they would fold it over and then that would give them 24 writing surfaces 24 pages by folding it over and binding it in the middle so if he took four gatherings of six and then one gathering of five because they were short on paper they they didn't have enough to do the to fill out the last uh, full page so joseph kept the last page they were working on. But he gave them these 116 pages. That's how one way that they could have gotten 116 pages. Another theory is that it's the 116 pages represents how much the, the plates of Nephi translated. There's lots of ways to interpret that. I just think this is an interesting diagram to understand 116 pages. Wait, you just cut out there for a sec, okay. Jonathan. Sorry. Can you just repeat that last part, like the second Okay. Yeah, some people think the 116 pages represents how much the retranslation took up. In other words, the uh, small plates of Nephi for 116 pages. So, I, I I think Royal Skousen has has a good explanation here that I agree with. I mean, there's there's no evidence for sure one way or, or another, except that we do have similar types of manuscripts i've seen some myself from the late 1830s or 1820s that were folded over and sewn up just like this so it makes sense that they would do it this way okay then they had their first child who died and you can see the burial uh, still at their in uh, harmony so joseph returned to palmyra to see what had happened martin harris tells him he lost the manuscript Joseph was told he could no longer translate for a season. And so from July until September, he didn't have the Urim and Thummim or the plates. So he gave, or so the, the book of Lehi was lost by Martin Harris. So I just gray that out. That's disappeared. And then Joseph got the plates back, returned to Harmony. And around in November was when he started retranslating again with him as a scribe. But it was going slow. It was taking a long time. So by the time April came around, Oliver Cowdery came. And, well, first he was living with the Smith family, and then um, and he met David Whitmer. Lord appeared to him and told him to go help Joseph, basically. So he left with uh, Samuel, Joseph's brother, 
On April 3rd, Joseph was praying for help. On April 5th, Oliver Cowdery showed up at the Hale Farm. Back here, the same route. Now, at this point, it's important to review the order of translation because for some people, this is confusing. The Book of Mormon we have today is in chronological order. It starts with Nephi in Jerusalem and then it goes all the way to the end. But that is not how it was translated. It wasn't translated in that order. And that's why I put this slide up to show. The first translation was Joseph transcribing some of the characters. He said he copied and translated some of the characters. Martin Harris took them to New York. And then when Martin Harris came back from New York, they translated the Book of Lehi, or Mormon's abridgment of the Book of Lehi, 116 pages. That was the first thing. The second thing that was translated was the following year in Harmony again, in February and March, uh, it appears that Mosiah, they translated Mosiah, actually it started in November, but from November to March, translated Mosiah, and then starting in April when Oliver showed up, they started translating from Alma through the end of, of Moroni. And then it was up in Fayette that Joseph and Oliver translated First Nephi through Words of Mormon. So the last part that was translated is the first part of today's Book of Mormon, just because of the chronological order. And that you'll see why that's important in a minute here. Here's a, a redaction chart that shows the same thing. The first thing was the Book of Lehi translated first in Harmony. And then the rest of what we have today in the Book of Mormon from Mosiah to the end was translated in Harmony. And then this the small plates of Nephi were translated up in Fayette last. Okay. And just again to show one more time on the chart, the Harmony plates... The bridge plates were all translated down in Harmony, Pennsylvania. The Fayette plates, which was first Nephi five through Words of Mormon, were translated up in Fayette. Okay, so now that we have that clear, hopefully there's no questions about that. So back in April 1829, Joseph and Oliver started translating. And Oliver began writing for Joseph, probably in, in Alma. There's reasons why we think Mosiah was already translated by the time Oliver got there. Now, this one was depicting the translation, and we talked about this in the previous webinars, that the accounts from Joseph and Oliver always talk about the Urim and Thummim and the plates. And then today there's scholars that say, no, he didn't use the plates. He used the stone and the hat. For purposes of my presentations, I say, no, he never used the stone and the hat to translate. May have used it for something else, but not to translate. Okay, so here um, the scriptures told Joseph to translate the engravings on the plates. And Oliver Cowdery testified one time, I'll just read this real quick. He said that Joseph Smith found with the plates from which he translated his book two transparent stones resembling glass, a glass set in silver bows. That by looking through these, he was able to read in English the reformed Egyptian characters which were engraven on the plates. I think in the previous webinar, we talked about that a little bit to say that what he was seeing was kind of a, a literal English translation, not grammatically useful. He had to actually translate that into words that we can all understand today the way we, he did it. So that's that's how I explained what Oliver Cowdery said here. But the bottom line is Oliver Cowdery said he looked through the Urim and Thummim at the characters on the plates, and that's how he did the translation. Nothing about any stone in the hat. Okay, so they were they continued translating, and they started, as I said, with the Book of Mosiah, went through Alma. There's this one passage in Alma, Alma 45:22, that's in Joseph Smith's handwriting, and there's two theories about that. One is that um, Maybe this was something Oliver was able to translate. You know, he the Lord told him he was authorized to translate, but he wasn't able to continue. And so maybe this portion, um, Joseph acted as scribe for Oliver's translation. The other theory is that Oliver got a hand cramp or got tired, and he couldn't write. He had to take a break, in other words. And so Joseph Smith just wrote out the part that he had just translated, that phrase. But here's what the manuscript looks like. On that, um, that little dark part in the middle might be a little hard to see, but it, it's Joseph Smith's handwriting on the original manuscript. So that's just kind of an interesting detail here. <laughs> Not really relevant to exactly what we're talking about. Okay, now in DNC 9, though, this is where the Lord says, because you did not translate according to that which you desired of me, 
um, and did commence right again for my servant. Now, see, that fits that what I just showed you. If he translated just that little part, but he couldn't continue, he didn't translate the way he wanted to, then he started to write again for uh, Joseph Smith. Even so, it continues, even so I would that you should continue until you have finished this record, which I have entrusted unto him. And then behold, other records have I that I will give unto you power that you may assist to translate. So the question is twofold. First, what is the record that, that they're supposed to finish? And what are the other records? So to keep that in mind, think about what those were. Uh, shortly after this, they uh, were talking pre presumably in 3rd Nephi uh, about baptism. And so Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery prayed about it. DNC 13 is um, when the Aaronic Priesthood was restored. This is an artist's depiction of that. They baptized one another and so on. We know all that. So then they continued translating through the Book of Moroni. So here they are. They've translated all everything that's in the abridged plates from Moroni's stone box except for the sealed portion of ether, including the title page, which was on the last leaf. But as they started getting near the end of the uh, translating the abridgment in Moroni's editions, they wonder if they're supposed to go back and retranslate the book of Lehi that was 116 pages that were lost. So they, they think about doing that. And instead, the Lord told them, don't retranslate the book of Lehi. And I assume you all are familiar with DNC 10, so I won't go through the whole thing. But it, it tells him, don't retranslate the book of Lehi. Instead, you have to translate the plates of Nephi. And th these are some of the passages that are in there. Uh, it says, um, uh, the account of those things, it, it, another account is engraven upon the plates of Nephi. More particular account, on the again, upon the plates of Nephi. Now, because the account which was engraven upon the plates of Nephi is more particular, he says, therefore, you shall translate the engravings which are on the plates of Nephi, and you shall publish it as a record of Nephi. And here's the key thing to realize, and that is that they didn't have the plates of Nephi at that point. The Lord was telling them, now you have to translate the plates of Nephi, and, and he's very specific to translate the engravings on the plates of Nephi, and not read words off a stone and a hat, right? He had to translate the engravings that were on particular plates. So if they didn't have the plates of Nephi, how did they get them? And that's what we'll talk about here next. Uh, again, this is just a refresher about the order of translation. We have already talked about this. I don't need to review it. So, um, again, this is to reiterate that the title page doesn't say there's any original plates of Nephi in there. It's just abridgments. Uh, and this is the title page. I don't think we need to go back through this. That's what it looks like. Okay, some of this is repetitive because some, sometimes I talk to people that this is all brand new to. So here's the traditional assumption. And, and this I took this out of a church manual one time. The original idea was that the source plates were the small plates of Nephi that were inserted somewhere in the collection of plates in the stone box. And then there were large plates in the plates of ether. They were all combined. Joseph Smith translated the whole thing. But the revised assumption is the source plates were in um, Mormon's depository in the Hill Cumorah were the small plates. In Moroni's stone box were the abridged plates. You see the difference? So in other words, the source plates were still the large plates, the small plates, and the plates of ether. But the abridged plates were only from the large plates of Nephi and the plates of ether. The small plates Joseph translated those directly up in Fayette, translated the abridged plates in harmony. So you see, is that I think that diagram is pretty clear to show the difference. I'll just compare one more time. So originally the idea was that all the plates that Joseph translated were in the stone box. And now the idea is only the abridged plates were in the stone box. The small plates of Nephi came from the repository. So now we're going to see how that happened. Okay, Lucy, in her account wrote that um, she, he, Joseph was learning about the lawsuit with Lucy Harris through the Ehrman Thummim. And then she said for uh, one morning, he, as he applied them to his eyes to look upon the record, again, re reiterating what Oliver Cowdery said, instead of the words of the book being given to him, he was commanded to write a letter to David Whitmer. 
And Joseph had never seen David Whitmer, but he's instructed to tell him to come and pick him up, basically. So when Joseph uh, commenced making preparations for the journey, he asked the Lord what he should do with the plates. And the Lord said to commit them to the hands of an angel. And then the angel would deliver them to his hands up in Fayette. So I have this... Um, now, this happens to be in French. Sorry. I I, I have this book, um, Lemurs, uh, Chameleons, and Golden Place, where I've illustrated all this. And so I'll just translate this real quick. It says, while Joseph was translating, he received a commandment to contact a, a, a man, an angel, that he had, or no, a man, I'm sorry, a man he had never met, which was, um, in the next panel, he says, the Lord asked me to contact David Whitmer. And Oliver Cowdery says, I know him, I will write him a letter. So, in fact, uh, Oliver wrote a letter to David Whitmer to say, can you come and pick us up so we can translate at the farm? So getting back to this book, now these are in English, says, Joseph gives the place to the messenger. Emma says, how do you know David is coming? And Joseph says, the Lord told me he's on the way. And Emma said, what about the plates? And Joseph says, the Lord told me to give them to a messenger. So he's taking the plates, leaves the house, meets this messenger in, in the forest who was the, the man that, um, well, the divine messenger. So here's, um, this is how it's been described in church history, that David was anxious to respond to the letter that Oliver wrote. And you may remember this, the church did a film on this, actually. And it says, the day after they received the letter, David went to plow the fields and discovered that they'd been miraculously plowed. Here's a scene from that movie. Many of you have probably seen this scene where the, the fields are all plowed. And then he went to plaster them to spread fertilizer. And his sister said the previous day, they'd watched three strangers spread the plaster with great skill and speed. So the idea was that those were the three Nephites. And then David, when they saw this miracle, David, his father told them, well, there must be God's hand in this. So go down and pick up the guys in Pennsylvania after all. So. David Whitmer goes, picks him up. Joseph Oliver and David left Harmony to go to Fayette. And then along the road, they met this same messenger. And he said, it's very warm. And David Whitmer says, yeah, it's warm. We can give you a ride to Fayette. And he goes, no, I'm going to Camorra. David Whitmer thought, Camorra, I've never heard of that place before. And, and David Whitmer wrote about, or talked about this later in different interviews he gave. So he turned to ask uh, Joseph what what he thought about it and um the guy disappeared or had walked off and joseph told him it was one of the three nephites and he had the plates so that was that incident right there which unfortunately is not depicted in the films about this event they just skipped over this they show joseph in harmony and they show him in fayette but they don't show this encounter with the messenger so um, saw this account would the messenger be taking the abridged plates from harmony to Camorra before showing up in Fayette. And that's when this next part of this uh, scenario, this narrative developed. So what I think happened here is the messenger, well, we know the messenger took the place to Camorra because he told David Whitmer he was going to do that. So the old man was one of the three Nephites. We know that from Joseph Smith. He was permitted to remain in mortality until Christ comes again, which we've all read about in fourth Nephi, third and fourth Nephi. So the messenger picked up the bridge plates to keep them safe took him to the hill Camorra where the repository was. And here's Mormon's repository, like that uh, artist depiction we saw earlier. The safest place for the plates was in the depository of Nephi records in the hill Camorra. So he sets the messenger left the abridged plates there, and he picked up the plates, the small plates of Nephi that were in the repository this whole time. He, he picked those up, put them in the backpack, leaves, covers up the the hill again or the repository the access to the repository takes him to fayette and then here's um oliver joseph and david arriving in, at the whitmer farm and then here's the account with mary whitmer which we've read about in saints and other places she's out uh, milking the cows or getting ready to milk the cows and someone calls her name and says my my name is brother nephi now this is a little bit of a side note but it's important to understand too because Mary Whitmer always said that the man introduced himself as Brother Nephi. And it was um, later on in the late 1800s, mid 1800s, 
there's a guy who is compiling the church history called Andrew Jensen. His name was Andrew Jensen. And he wrote down this account that the grandson related that his mother said his name was, he called himself Brother Nephi. And Andrew Jensen inserted a paragraph or a parenthesis in there where he said, well, she must have meant Moroni because it was Moroni who had responsibility for the plays. <laughs> so it's kind of a ridiculous thing that he's saying that Mary Whitmer was wrong, that it had to be Moroni. And ever since then, this idea that it was Moroni who showed the place to Mary Whitmer has acquired now. It's been published in the Saints magazine, even though it's a totally bogus uh, narrative. It contradicts what Joseph Smith said when he said it was one of the three Knights, that, three Nephites who would continue to live. Contra it contradicts what David Whitmer said, because he met this guy on the road and said it was the same guy that uh, met Mary, showed the place to Mary. So anyway, that, that's how these um, these legends of being Moroni get generated. They just change church history to accommodate some idea. Anyway, so he said, this Nephi, one of the Nephites said, the Lord wanted me to show you the place because of your faithfulness and the extra work you're doing. Take care of Joseph and Oliver. So that's where she saw the plates. Okay. So then later uh, that day or some period of time, the messenger gave the plates of Nephi to Joseph Smith. And that's why Joseph translated those in Fayette. Okay. So just to recap this, uh, they went to uh, David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery, the messenger, we don't know which route they took, obviously, but somewhere along the way, this is what David Whitmer um, described in his own words. This was from what he told Orson Pratt and Joseph F. Smith. I was returning to Fayette with Joseph and Oliver, all of us riding in the wagon, Oliver and I on an old-fashioned wooden spring seat, and Joseph behind us. We uh, were suddenly approached by a very pleasant, nice-looking old man in a clear open place who saluted us with, good morning, is very warm. At the same instant, wiping his face or forehead with his hand. Now, you know, as a lawyer, I look at this and I think this is credible testimony because he's describing these details. He didn't say exactly what day it was, but he describes what the what the day was like and how the guy was wiping his hand or his forehead. We returned the salutation, and by a sign from Joseph, I invited him to ride if he was going our way. But he said very pleasantly, no, I am going to Camorra. This was something new to me. I did not know what Camorra meant. And as I looked inquiringly at Joseph, the old man instantly disappeared so that I did not see him again. Now, whether he vanished in plain sight or he just walked off in the in the forest, we don't know. But So here's another artist's depiction of the, of the messenger saying, no, I'm going to Camorra. All right. So somewhere along the route here, we don't know where they encountered the messenger. And then people have asked, well, why would he not go to Fayette on his way to uh, Camorra? And that's, you could take this other route that would avoid uh, the cities or the towns along the way there, which presumably the messenger would want to do. So that's one scenario. Okay, you took the plates there. And then uh, Joseph F. Smith asked him, did you notice his appearance? And he said, that, yeah, I did. He was about five feet, nine or 10 inches tall. Heavy set, about such a man as James Van Cleve there, but heavier. His face was as large. He was dressed in a suit of brown woolen clothes. His hair and beard were white, felt like Brother Pratt's, but his beard was not so heavy. Orson Pratt, of course, was famous for having a big, bushy beard. I remember, I also remember that he had a sort of knapsack on his back and something was in it which was shaped like a book. It was a messenger who had the plates. So that's the account he gave to Orson Pratt and Joseph S. Smith. Uh, on another occasion, um, this was Edward Stevenson, who was um, an ancestor of Elder Stevenson today. But he, he went back, Stevenson went back and did a bunch of interviews for church history. He was just interested in all this. And so he says, David Whitmer relates a, a little very interesting account. They're writing from Harmony. Um, now here he said the two former in front, Joseph in the back, sitting on the bed on hay or straw. David had been down with his team over 100 miles to fetch Joseph, okay? While thus riding, an aged-looking old man came walking along, putting his hand on the wagon bed. He had on his back a knapsack and a strap across his breast as he took his handkerchief and wiped his face to remove the sweat. As it seemed to them, David, who was driving his team, said to the man, uh, will you get up and ride? No, said he, I'm only going over to Camorra. 
and suddenly disappear, they stopped the team at the sudden disappearance of the fine-looking stranger. He said that they all felt so strangely, they asked the prophet to inquire of the Lord who this stranger was. Soon David said they turned around and Joseph looked pale, almost transparent, said that it was one of the Nephites, and he had the plates of the Book of Mormon in the knapsack. And upon their arrival home, they felt the influence of the same persons around them, for he said there was a heavenly feeling with this Nephite. So David didn't say that he saw him in Fayette, but his mother did. Now, one thing that is interesting here that I put in blue, Joseph looked pale, almost transparent. And obviously, if he had given the place to the messenger, he already knew who it was, so that wouldn't have been a shock. But what would have been a shock is the messenger taking the place to Camorra, because as far as Joseph knew, the only thing that was in Camorra was the stone box. That's the only thing he had seen to this point. And so what I surmise from this is that when the messenger told him he was taking those plates to Camorra, that's when Joseph realized that the whole repository of all the Nephite plates was in the same hill. And the reason that that's significant for a couple of reasons. One is he and, and Oliver had just translated um, uh, that Book of Mormon, Mormon 6.6, where Mormon described the repository with all the Nephi records. But there's no indication that they had told Joseph that it was in that same hill until this moment. And once, if you remember Joseph, when he was uh, first charged to get the plates, he had to wait for four years because he was tempted to sell them or to find other artifacts to sell. And it took him that long to overcome that temptation. By now, he had matured enough. He'd had the plates for uh, about a year and a half, and so he was comfortable with them. He wasn't trying to sell them or figure out how to get money with them. But when this messenger said, hey, I'm going to Camorra, Joseph, I, th I think it dawned on Joseph that all those other uh, relics and Nephi records were in that same hill, and that's why he turned pale like this. And there's another account of him turning pale for the same reason. And that's why, if you remember in um, Fayette, Often, or at least one occasion, David said that Joseph's mind was on things of the world and he couldn't translate when it happened like that. Once he had an argument with Emma, but another time his, his, his mind was on things of the world, which, again, would make sense if he was thinking about that repository with all that full of gold and records and stuff. So, uh, again, this is another one where uh, another version of this Edward Stevenson account, the other one was from his journal, I think, and this is what he published. Where David said, um, he asked him for Rai, but he declined saying, I'm going over to Camorra. And again, here's where the prophet, in this case, he said the prophet looked very white um, and said their visitor is one of the three Nephites to whom the Savior gave promise of life on earth until he should come in power. So it's clearly, according to David Whitmer, which, I mean, he was credible here in talking about this whole, the details of this whole event. Um, Joseph Smith said it was one of the three ne Nephites who was promised that they could continue to live. It wasn't Moroni at all, which also explains why when they describe Moroni, Oliver Cowdery wrote a description of Moroni saying he was taller than average and glorious and all that, whereas this guy was shorter than average, heavy set, and older. Okay, here's the, the Peter Whitmer farm as it looks today. Uh, they have a chapel there. Um, let's see. We've been going an hour, so I'm, I'll go a little faster if that's okay, Oak. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's pick it up a little bit. Okay, so they translated First Nephi through Words of Mormon, and here's uh, which they got in Fayette, right? They did this translation in Fayette. And then uh, First Nephi through Words of Mormon is what we have today. So where did they get the plates of Nephi? They came from the messenger, so they came directly from the repository. So this is my diagram of how we got the Book of Mormon we have today. Let me, let me walk you through this real quick. And this is kind of the summary of the whole thing. So we see what was in the repository originally. All the abridged, original, or not abridged, the original plates that Mormon moved from the hill shim into the repository in Camorra. Then in the stone box, stone and cement box that Moroni had, he put the abridged plates along with the Urim and Thummim and the breastplate. So he only put the things in there that Joseph Smith needed at that time. But then because Martin Harris lost the plates of Lehi, and the Lord told him, don't retranslate the plates of Nephi, now you have to translate the engravings on the plates of Nephi, not the abridged plates, but the plates of Nephi. Joseph didn't have those, so he had to get them from somewhere. And so the messenger took the abridged plates, 
back to the repository, picked up the small plates of Nephi, brought those to Fayette, and that's why he translated those in Fayette. And that's how you get the, the, our, our current uh, Book of Mormon, starting with the plates of Nephi and then down through uh, the title page, the Moroni's original writings. That's how you can understand how this all makes sense. Now, let's see. I, the rest of it, I think, let me get out of this PowerPoint in, in the interest of time. So um, the, the reason this is significant, remember at the beginning I said that there were different accounts of how much the plates weighed? And his father said they weighed 30 pounds. Well, what plates did his father see? His father was one of the eight witnesses, right? And when you read through that account of the eight witnesses, none of them say there was a sealed portion. And they said they handled the plates, they turned them. Right, they saw the part that Joseph translated. None of them said there was a sealed portion, and so what I think happened is the three witnesses had a, an experience with Moroni, where he brought not only the the uh, abridged plates, but the brass plates. David Whitmer said, and, and DNC seventeen says they saw the plates of Laban and the Leahona, all these other artifacts. Right, but those that was what the Moroni showed to them. They said it was Moroni at least. David Wimmer said he had a conversation with both the messenger and with Moroni separately, and they were different people. Anyway, so that's what they saw was they even said that part of it looked like it was sealed. David Wimmer talked about. Whereas the eight witnesses never saw the, the messenger, never saw Moroni, but Joseph Smith had just translated those small plays. So he took them back over to, to uh, Palmyra and showed them to the eight witnesses. And he was he, actually Joseph Smith was never commanded not to show the the plates of Nephi to anybody. He was commanded not to show the the abridged plates, but the the eight plates or the the plates of Nephi he showed to the eight witnesses. They handled them. None of them said there was an abridgment or a, a sealed portion. And then Joseph and Oliver took those plates back to the Hill Cumorah, the repository. That's why you know Brigham Young talked about the repository with all the plates in it, based on what Oliver Cowdery told him. And Oliver said they had been there multiple times, at least twice, maybe more than that. So that's why this is cool. It, this whole understanding of the two sets of plates reconciles discrepancies between the witnesses as far as how much the plates weighed. Maybe on the size. I mean, they were they were always a little bit vague about the size of the plates. And, and then, um, but it also explains why we have the... The, the translation in Fayette that was different from the translation in Harmony, the two different sets of plates. But most important, I think, for purposes of today is it ties into what we talked about in the previous ones about the importance of the Urim and Thummim and the plates. Joseph had to have the plates to translate them. And the Lord went through all this trouble to have the small plates of Nephi so that he could translate those in Fayette. Whereas if he was just using a stone in the hat, the Lord could have said, don't worry, Play these words, of and that's the opposite of what happened. You yeah. just cut out again. I don't know what. Oh, the, can I? Yeah, just like the last ten seconds. Okay. Well, I was maybe I was speaking too fast. Uh, I was saying that if you read DNC ten, the Lord says that you have to translate the engravings on the plates of Nephi. If he wasn't actually translating the engravings on the plates of Nephi, the Lord could have said. Just keep reading what's, whatever shows up on the stone. You know, according to the guys who say Joseph never used the plates, the, that whole section 10 doesn't make any sense because the Lord was identifying specific plates for him to translate. And it's, it's important for us to understand that because it, it, this whole two sets of plates scenario validates what Joseph and Oliver said all along about the translation. And I think it's cool. You know, a lot of times in... Um, when you read accounts of, of history or you're reading through court depositions and stuff, sometimes when the, the way people talk about events, they give you bits and pieces of it, but you can't put it all together. And when you put it all together and all the testimonies all fit finally, then it, it validates all the different accounts. It does, instead of having this discrepancy of people saying the place weigh different amounts or different sizes and so on, look different, now we can understand that everybody was telling the truth about the place based on their own experience. They were talking about two different sets of plates. So let me see if I can recap a couple of things and then you just interrupt me and correct okay. as we go. Right. So 
original set of plates in the uh, cement box, stone box, um, was the abridgment that came right. from Mormon abridging everything. It had the sealed portion, and Joseph retrieves those under the direction of Moroni, translates mm -hmm. them, and then, uh, well, he translates the Book of Lehi, loses the Urim and Thummim and the plates for a season, mm -hmm. and gets it back. And delivered back by Moroni right. and finishes that translation. And then there's other records. So they travel to Fayette, but along the way, um, they they haven't had he hasn't seen the, the other plates yet until he gets there. Is that right? Like Nephi. Yeah, well, because it and they got the commandment to translate the the engravings on the plates of Nephi, but he didn't have those. Okay. But is Nephi the one then? one of the three Nephites that is traveling the road, carrying those plates for him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so he gets to Fayette. He's going to now translate the small plates, the direct mm -hmm. uh, writings of Nephi. And <clears throat> so he, he does that. And then when he's completed that, he and Oliver, instead of handing those plates over to an angel, it's, is it your opinion that they just took them right to the Nephite repository at that time yeah. and put them back in? In, in fact, that, this is another discrepancy in church history that this explains. If you read in Joseph Smith's history, he says they returned the plates to the messenger at, by prior arrangement, which is what happened in Harmony. Brigham Young said that when he was done with the plates, he took them back to the repository. So that's a discrepancy right there. But if you understand, they're talking about two different sets of plates, and it makes sense. Is so, it, go ahead. Yeah. So, why did they go to the repository multiple times if he was just returning the plates? Did they maybe store them there for a period of time? Go get them back? Is, do you okay. have a theory on that? That's a, that's a good question. I th what I think is they took them from Joseph and Oliver took them from Fayette to the repository, and then a day or two later they went and got them to show to the eight witnesses. That's that's what I think. Okay, and, and that's just because we don't know exactly what days were involved, but it was, it was a day or two after they showed or they finished the translation in Fayette that they showed plates to the eight witnesses. Okay, so so the other thing that comes in is uh, if Joseph Smith Sr. hefted the plates and weighed them, that would have been the plates of Moroni, the, the abridgment. No, no. It would have been the, what he saw as a, one of the eight witnesses. Oh, how would he have weighed them if they just were shown those plates? That, I guess Joseph took them home with him after his dad. Well, they had, this is an interesting thing. A lot of times you see the artwork of eight witnesses standing around a semicircle, right? Yeah. According to Lucy, there are two sets of four witnesses. They didn't all see him at the same time. Okay. And so, and and whether you know, it's it's vague. Lucy wasn't an eyewitness to this; she was just recounting what people told her. But it's conceivable that the Whitmers, you know, the Christian Whitmer and Hiram Page, the brother-in-law, saw them on one occasion, and then the other saw them on another occasion. But it could have been the same day, same afternoon, even just in two different places, and it wasn't far from their home. So for them to take them and weigh them would be fairly easy. I mean, it's right there in Palmyra. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Hmm. And then, uh, so, so in terms of like how much they weighed, 30, 30 pounds for the small plates of Nephi. Mm -hmm. And do we have any idea on the large plates then? Well, as I, as I recall, I think even uh, Martin Harris said they weighed around 40 pounds. But other people said 60. And that's one of the things that critics say, well, how could Joseph Smith haul 60 pounds of plates home? And and people say, well, they had rings on them. You put a stick through there, you can carry them. You know, 60 pounds isn't that much, really. I mean, yeah. so yeah. people can carry 60 pounds, especially farmers, you know, young farm boys. So, but it's a big difference between 30 and 60. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's always, see... Just so you know, a background of this, okay, I, I read what the critics say because I'm interested in everybody's point of view. And I noticed there were a lot of criticism about the witnesses describing plates differently. And this was one of them. 
the, the different weights. And I thought, well, how could that be? Because it wouldn't be that far off. And then when I realized, okay, the messenger was right in the church history. The messenger was taking the place of Gomorrah. There's no reason to do that if it wasn't to get the other place. I'd like to analogize it to, um, let's say that Martin Harris had taken King Benjamin's address with him instead. Well, there's a backup back in the repository that Joseph could have gotten to replace it. So I, I look at it as kind of a redundancy thing that there was just like on your computer, you are supposed to back it up. No matter what Martin Harris lost or anybody else lost, there was a backup over in the, in the repository. So to me, that's just prudent management on the part of the Lord, but it also makes the whole narrative make so much more sense. Hmm. Okay. Um, I have a question here from Bruce. Yeah. Uh, why does Saints Volume 1 call it a stone box? I guess he's kind of answering his his own question. He said, because the scholars want the events of the Book of Mormon to happen in Mesoamerica, they don't believe the savages of North America knew how to use cement. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's that intricate of a conspiracy. I, definitely the historians are accommodating the Mesoamerica. And I've I've heard from, let's just say, senior people in the church history department that that was not the intent. I just don't. Whether it was the actual intent or not, it was definitely subliminal if it wasn't overt because they all think it's in Mesoamerica. And it, it's, it's very easy to show how they would start a quotation from Lucy Mack Smith and then omit what she said about Camorra. You know, it's, it's kind of unbelievable in a way. But it's in there. We can all read it in the Saints book. Whether I don't think anybody's contesting that it was not a cement box because that's I'm pretty sure that's right in Joseph Smith history where he said it was cement. So yeah, um, see, he actually uh, quoted from uh, Joseph Smith history. Yeah, the box in which they lay was formed by laying stones together in some kind of cement. Yeah. And then Oliver Cowdery was a little more elaborate in letter number eight when he talked about it. But Cool. Well, does anybody else have any questions that you'd like to ask Jonathan while we have him here? So I, great I'll, I'll show you a little painting that I did of this. Okay. So one of the, one of the questions that comes up is, Oliver Cowdery wrote in letter number seven that there was a, um, that the, the final battle of the Jaredites and the Nephites took place. There's a, there's a ridge one mile west of the hill Cumorah. And he says it was between these hills, these two hills. So I thought I'd, I'd do a little painting. I don't know if you can even see it here. But it, this is my idea of, yeah, yeah, I guess you can see it. So this is Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and Nephi sitting on top of the hill Cumorah, looking over to the mile-wide valley, to the hill on the other side, and Nephi's explaining to them this history of the Book of Mormon. That's, what, that's how Oliver Cowdery could say it was a fact. Because he didn't say it's my suspicion or I figured this out by reading the text. He says it's a fact that this is where it happened. So I, a lot of times you have to visualize something to understand it. So I did that little painting just to... He picked what it was. So Christy Kimball just asked a question. And Christy, I would refer you to the uh, part one and part two webinars for more about this. She asked, what did he use the stone in the hat for? So um, she may not have been here in the past. Can you just summarize that so that um, yeah. she understands? Okay, so there's, there's kind of three lines of thinking about the stone in the hat. One is that everybody who said the stone in the hat was just lying about it. Two is that he used the stone in the hat to produce the text of the Book of Mormon. That's the Sith stone in the hat narrative. And the third is that he used the stone in the hat as a demonstration. Um, there's there's a guy named, his last name is Gurley, who was a historian in the RLDS church. And he went around interviewing David Whitmer and John Whitmer and everybody he could. And he said, he never showed the Urim and Thummim to anybody except Oliver, possibly Oliver, who was translating. But he did have a stone, and he showed it to people to satisfy their awful curiosity, is the term he used. 
which means they were intensely curious about what was happening. And so there's one account by David Whitmer where he says that everybody sat around the table. I actually have a painting of that too down here. I could show you, but everybody's sitting. Do you want me to show you that too, just to give? This one's, this is just a rough block in. But this is how David Whitmer described it. He said there was a, everybody sitting around the table. Joseph put his face in the hat and dictated, just like it shows there. Okay, so I, I read that account and I thought, well, that that doesn't sound like translating to me because he didn't have the plates. He'd been under com commandment not to show the Urim and Thummim or the plates, so he couldn't have shown those to that crowd of people. So what was he doing on that occasion? And according to Gurley, he was using the... Um, stone on the hat to satisfy people's curiosity. So what I think he did here was a demonstration. He would tell people, look, I can't show you how I do the actual translation, but I'll show you kind of how it works. And I have a stone and I look on the plates, but I'll do it by looking into it a hat and I can see words on there. And I think that's all he was doing. And I don't think he did it to mislead anybody at all. I think he was just trying to explain to satisfy their curiosity, basically, which is what Gurley said after interviewing everybody. And even John Whitmer said he was using the Urim and Thummim and the breastplate when he was translating the plates. He was the other scribe, right? So that's what I think he used it for. It's the same reason there were times when people would ask Joseph Smith for a revelation and he would, you know, meditate and pray. And then he would start dictating a revelation and say, wait a minute, we want you to use the seer stone. And he didn't need to use the seer stone at all, but the people needed that to have faith. It's, it's sort of like when the woman touched uh, Christ's robe and she had enough faith that if she could just touch his robe, she'd be healed. The robe didn't heal her. It was her faith that did. But faith can be concentrated by a physical object. And I think that's what Joseph used the seer stone for. I don't think he needed it to translate at all. Otherwise, there's no reason to have the urine with them, right? So that's kind of how I see it. It's a longer explanation. We have a whole book about it, you know, but because there, there's a lot of accounts that you have to reconcile. And just to, real quick on that, witnesses very often, maybe usually, will testify about something in court, and they'll they'll sound totally convinced and accurate, and then someone else who observed the exact same thing will say the opposite, right? So you have eyewitness accounts, both telling the truth, and they're contradicting each other. And that's the nature of eyewitness uh, testimony. And so people's memories are vague. They notice different details and so on. So I think that the the uh, Sith witnesses, Emma and David primarily, were had an apologetic reason. That's getting into the weeds too much. But they were basing it on this demonstration. Let me just leave it there. Okay, and she, she also followed up and said, I thought it was to view the plates while he was away from home to make sure the plates were safe. Is there a, a record of that that you recall? Yeah, yeah there was a record when um, Emma got word that the plates were being, someone was going to come get the plate. She ran, got on a horse well that Joseph was working on, and he said, let me check. It. Basically, he looked in the arm and thumb him and could see that they were okay. Urim and Thummim or uh, the seer stone? No, he had the Urim and Thummim by then. Okay. Now, the interesting, this, we could get into the weeds on the seer stone, but a lot of people cite what Lucy said about it. And she said that uh, Stoll came up and hired Joseph because there was a rumor that he could see things. And apparently, Stoll tested him and he could see. Um, something involves the tree. I don't remember the detail of that right now. I haven't looked at that in a long time. So he had some ability with the seer stone, apparently. But it sounds, based on what Oliver Cowdery said about it and what Joseph himself said and Lucy, whatever he was doing with the stone was blown way out of proportion by the critics. So... Yeah. I see some comments about cement and concrete and all that. Um... I just look at, um, you know, it's a translation to begin with. And cement, it's true that cement is not concrete, but I don't know that Joseph and Oliver were making distinctions like that in any of this. But cement, I know I, I have a friend who did a, um, 
a, a really interesting paper. He hasn't published it yet, but he showed that Joseph and Oliver don't understand masonry, not masonry, the, you know, the practice masonry, the actually using stones and bricks and mortar. They don't understand how that works because when Joseph Smith did the cornerstone in Nauvoo, he'd built it so bad that it leaked and destroyed most of the manuscript, right? So when Oliver Cowdery was describing what the box looked like, it wasn't based on their knowledge, it was based on their observation. And that's a, a key point because the when Moroni built that stone box, he built it so it was waterproof. No water got in there. And he, how he knew how to do that is another question, but the way Oliver described it was that way. And jo neither Joseph and Oliver understood that kind of construction well enough to describe it. On, from their imagination, they had to be describing an actual thing, which is a, it's a really interesting point. That, isn't isn't there a record of um, like or a comment that within the box there was sort of like a raised portion that yeah. things sat on? I always thought that was if there was water that got in, it would go down below and evaporate and not yeah definitely damage. or even condensation in there. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, his mother, and that quote I started off with, she described it as three pillars of cement. And other people say there were stone set in cement. So somewhere in there, there was stone and cement somehow that kept it safe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why it's important, this idea of it being um, gold versus an alloy. William said it was gold and copper. And when... Um, uh, what was the guy that saw the corner of the place when he lifted him in the window? I have to think of his name for a minute. Anyway, he said that he's part of the cloth came off and he saw there was a greenish color on there, which would imply that there was copper in there in the alloy. But if it was copper and it was exposed to extensive water, it would have corroded really badly. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. well, awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been really enlightening and uh, fun to see that all laid out and have an opportunity to to hear how that worked so um we just appreciate you doing these uh presentations for us and explaining that that's that's what really well, cool. i'm happy to you know it's been it's been fun to see more and more people um start to realize that this makes sense and it, it's very interesting that it, it, this whole account of meeting the messenger taking the place to kimura has been what I call decorrelated because there's a book called opening the heavens that supposedly has all the accounts relating to the translation and they deliberately omit that thing. They, they have the messenger meeting the messenger, but they just say, instead of quoting what David Whitmer said, they paraphrase it and say the messenger took the place to Fayette. They omit everything about Kimura. And as, as people have pointed out here, the saints book does the same thing. It's just fraudulent as far as I'm concerned. And I, I, but like I say, senior people in the church history department have told me as recently as this week that that wasn't the intent. But, and, and that's why I think it was more of a group think thing rather than we can't mention Kimura. It's just it never dawned on any of them that Kimura is still in New York because they think it's all in Mexico. So I'm, I'm, I keep lobbying the church history department to come clean and let's just fix the saints book so that it's actual history instead of a modern narrative. So far, I've been unsuccessful, <laughs> but, but I'm still trying, you know, and, and I know people write to the church history department and complain. So they, the more they hear that, maybe they'll, because they could still fix it in the digital version. Yeah. It, or or publish an errata or something. Yeah, they'll never do that. But but <laughs> like they do with the gospel topics, I says when they fix a mistake, they just fix it. They don't announce it, mm -hmm. and with the idea that nobody's going to remember what the old one said, and they don't annotate the date. It's not like Wikipedia where every change is documented. They don't do that at all. And I'm hoping that they do that with the Saints book, as well as with the gospel topics essays. But you know, we just have to keep lobbying and the, the beauty of it from my perspective is that the brethren the church leaders have always told us study the scriptures the teachings of the prophets in authentic church history none of them say read the musings of the scholars right and so i just stick with the prophets scriptures and authentic church history and when you do that i think you're on pretty solid ground and as, as you can see today just sticking with those sources 
you can it all makes sense but aren't the uh gospel topics essays written by the scholars yeah okay (laughs) (laughs) and that but you know again people argue with me all the time that gospel topics essays are approved by the brethren so they're basically scripture i've had people tell me and i said no they're not if you read write the introduction to them they say they're just resources to be considered they were never intended to replace any scriptures or authentic church history or teachings of the prophets so that's that's an ongoing funny thing because i can't tell you how many times people quote me for the gospel topic says, says, well, it says here, and I'll say, yeah, okay, let's look up the references. And they don't support what it's saying. I just did a blog post on this, by the way, in the LDS Historical Narratives blog post, because <laughs> this whole thing about um, the stone in the hat starting with Joseph Smith, it's a, it's not only a misquote, but it's they've changed his story about um his name was jonathan hadley was a publisher in palmyra in 1829 and he wrote the first published account about the translation of the book of mormon but he never met joseph smith it was martin harris telling him stuff and he he was very anti-mormon he, he called them the the uh, gang of mormons he wanted to expose you know and so he wrote this stone in the hat account and everybody attributes it to joseph smith and it's unbelievable it's even in there's a new book out, Desert Book published called Let's Talk About. There's a series called Let's Talk About the Translations. It's, Let's Talk About the Translation of the Book of Mormon. The opening page starts with this fake, fake, false Jonathan Hadley account that's intended to say Joseph Smith started the stone on the hat stuff. It's unbelievable to me. And, you know, I even emailed Sherry Dew and I said, you've got to withdraw this book because <laughs> it's just fake news. And, and you can see Hadley wrote a later account explaining it all that they just pretend didn't exist. It's, it's unbelievable. So we're working on it. You know, everybody's, I think the historians are awesome. I think they're trying to do the right thing. We just have to call them out when they do this kind of fake news in church history. So. Well, again, thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate, appreciate this, appreciate all your efforts to try and help clean clean some of these things up i guess uh it just i guess we just need those I, let me let me mention one last thing and then we can really be done okay <laughs> so richard bushman has a new book out it's called joseph smith's gold plates it's a, a cultural history and i highly recommend it to everybody i mean it's not perfect if i had written it, it would be a little different but it's a really good book and in the back is an appendix and in the appendix he, he quotes for me and cites all my stuff about the two sets of plates, the translation with the Urim and Thummim. Um, anyway, all the things we talked about today are in Richard's new book. So now, for the first time, the entire church is going to see from Richard Bushman himself this idea of the two sets of plates and the translation and all these things that we've been talking about. It's awesome. And I think it's going to have a major impact. At least, At least people can... You know, people can discredit me because I don't work for the church or the church history department. That's fine. But now Richard Bushman, he's not saying this is what happened, but he said this is something everybody needs to take into consideration. It's elevated it to a level that now everybody will see. And you can show it to your friends if they don't, if they think the two sets of plates is bad or something. I don't know why they would, except for the Camorra element of it. But now you can go right to Richard Bushman, Bushman's book and see it too. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. Um, that's actually really what. What exactly is Richard Bushman's position with the with the church? Well, he's he doesn't work for the church. He's he's the um, he's a professor at well, he's an emeritus professor out of Columbia University in New York. Okay. But he's the the principal. Uh, guy on the joseph smith papers that started it him and two or three others but he coordinated with yale on the jonathan edwards um database that they did so they could kind of learn from some of the people at the jonathan edwards center at yale run the advisory board for the joseph smith papers and he was instrumental in making that happen and he's also i mean he probably knows church history as well as anyone better than almost anyone and he's been at it for a long time. Okay, the, the name of his book is um, Joseph Smith's Gold Plates, A Cultural History. And it was just released September 1st. 
So it's I, I got it on Kindle in advance, but um, it's it's a great book. I, I hope a lot of people read it, and I hope that it opens their eyes to this whole thing because it's it's really exciting, at least for me. You know, I, I think it's fascinating. Just to you know, the the second half of that that I've never really thought about that, why they went to the repository, why you know yeah. there could be a second set of plates. Yeah, yeah. well, but, I'll, I'll I'll give you just one more little thing, <laughs> and this is this is purely my speculation. But it's based on what Moroni said, because Moroni said that whoever got these plates would have access to the the account from the beginning, right? That Ether, he said, I'm not going to write all this because I suppose it's had by the Jews, right? Which sounds like he's talking about the Book of Moses. So how did Joseph get the Book of Moses? Right now in there, it says a revelation. But I think he got it from those plates. I think the first part, that's why I think you know, there's been a lot of discussion about why is the translation of the Bible called a translation when it wasn't really translating anything, right? He's just revising more. But I think it started as a translation. I think he got those those original plates that talked about Moses that Moroni said he would have access to. And he started translating those plates that were in the repository with Oliver Cowdery. Hmm. And then later they moved to Kirtland, and so it became more of a, I guess you could call it a revelation at that point either that or he i don't think he kept the place because he gave up the urine thumb too but I, th I think it started as a translation that's another reason they went to that repository multiple times and then the last thing is the, the title of the book is whatever happened to the golden place right so what i think happened is joseph and oliver and joseph's brothers moved that whole repository back to the hill shim but we don't have time to talk about all the reasons why <laughs> we'll just leave that as a, a closing note I know uh, when Joseph was doing the um, the JST, the inspired version of uh, going back through the Bible and making some corrections, uh, I have a quote, and I can't remember where it comes from, but he said that uh, he used the Urim and Thummim to read the Bible, and the Lord showed him everything that happened in the Bible. So he had it all in front of him, not that he made super significant changes all across the scriptures but he you know was able to see everything that took place so that he could then say okay i understand this i understand this yeah. and make some of those tweaks yeah so it's that's, fascinating that's a, that'd be an interesting topic for another one someday yeah <laughs> well thank you again okay. yeah so, happy to be here Thanks really appreciate it